Hi, it's a pleasure to have this opportunity to speak to you today at this virtual conference of the International Society for the Study of Religion, Nature and Culture. The paper I'd like to share with you today is not overtly about religion. Rather, it's about questions of meaning making and care for a more than human world. Before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you today from the traditional lands of the Gunungurra and Darug people in the Blue Mountains in Australia, and pay my respect to their elders, past, present and emerging, and to this country that they've cared for for so long. I'd also like to acknowledge that the, share, the stories I want to share with you today are from another colonised land, from the islands of Hawaii. And I'd like to pay my respects to those islands first, peoples, the Kanaka Māori. So I'll begin. Each new drawer we opened revealed another set of wonders, another surprising colour or variation in shape or size. In one drawer we encountered the tiny, delicate, translucent shells of Succinia lumbalis. In another, the large, grey, conical forms of Newcombia comingi. In other drawers, the tiny zebra-striped shells of Laminella aspera not more than a few millimetres in length when fully grown and yet intricately patterned nonetheless. In many other drawers, we found the colourful shells of the Acatonella tree snails in every shade of yellow, green and brown, some with bands and stripes, others sporting designs reminiscent of tweed or tortoise shell. Drawer after drawer, cabinet after cabinet, row after row, we moved through the Malacology collection of the Bishop Museum in Honolulu ultimately only seeing a tiny selection of their shells. I have to admit that I didn't really know what I was looking at. I had then and still have now, nothing like the trained eye of a taxonomist honed to the craft of identifying and categorizing species. The longer I spent staring at this diversity of land snail shells, the more convinced I became that I lacked almost entirely the ability to discern the subtle differences of form that matter to the experts in telling apart two closely related species. But there was also something oddly meditative about spending time amongst the shells, moving my eyes from one group to the next, drinking in the differences I could discern and not worrying too much about those that eluded me. My guide was Nora Jung, manager of this incredible repository of over 6 million snail shells from all over Hawaii and the broader Pacific region. I'd asked Nori to show me the collection and tell me about its history and significance. In particular, I wanted to speak to her about her taxonomic research, an effort to create a comprehensive inventory of snail life in the Hawaiian Islands. Drawing on this remarkable collection of shells and a broad array of other resources, Nori, along with her partner, Ken Hayes, and their colleagues are working to determine just how many Hawaiian snail species there once were as well as how many of them are still left. It's not well known that amongst its many biological richness, riches, sorry, Hawaii is a land of snails. While snails can be found all over the world, indeed they inhabit every continent and island archipelago outside the Arctic, very few other places supported anything like the variety found in this particular island chain. To date, 754 species of Hawaiian land snails have been officially described. But this number is subject to ongoing change, both as new species are discovered and as species formally identified, some of them well over 100 years ago, are revised. The actual number is thought by most scientists working in the area to probably be somewhere in the region of 1,000 species. But even at 754, the tiny patches of land that form these islands were once home to roughly two thirds the number of snail species that have been described from the whole of continental North America, a landmass about 1700 times the size. What's more, almost all of Hawaii species, about 99%, were endemic to these islands, found there and nowhere else. By any reckoning, Hawaii is a remarkable place when it comes to snails. Sadly, however, museum collections like this one at the Bishop are now the only place that most of these species, or rather their shells, can still be seen. 
Of the 754 described species, roughly 450 are thought to already be extinct, the majority of them having been lost in the past 100 years or so. The most comprehensive picture of the snail situation in Hawaii has been produced by Nori, Ken and their colleagues, drawing on thousands of hours in the field, looking for snails at sites throughout the islands. Informed by historical survey materials held in this museum and others around the world. Equally as concerning as those species already lost, this pre preliminary survey work has shown that the remaining 300 species are in a great deal of trouble. Of them, over 100 are classed as critically imperiled, reduced to a single known population in the wild. A further 120 species are down to, to just two or three populations. The research shows that a grand total of 11 species can be categorised as stable. The causes of this decline are complex. In the past, Hawaii snails suffered from extensive habitat loss as land was cleared for farming and ranching, as well as urban, tourist and military developments. For 100 years or so, beginning shortly after the arrival of Europeans and Americans, a shell collecting craze also decimated many species a period that some locals at the time referred to as land shell fever, and a period that somewhat ironically contributed many of the shells now held in the Bishop Museum and elsewhere, that are today providing vital information about snail decline and conservation. And incidentally, of course, it was the uh, especially US missionaries and their children that really uh, led this period of shell collecting. So those species remaining in Hawaii today are threatened primarily by more recently arrived predators, including rats, chameleons, and most significantly of all, a carnivorous snail, Euglandina rosea, which tracks the slime trails of the local species to consume them with a disturbing efficiency. In the midst of this incredible and ongoing loss, Nori and Ken are focused on snail taxonomy. Basic taxonomic research identifying and describing species is often taken for granted in conservation efforts, especially when we're dealing with vertebrate animals like mammals and birds, where we generally have a pretty good sense of who is who and even of their life histories and distributions. As we'll see, however, when it comes to snails and many other invertebrates, there is so much that we don't know, including really basic things like whether these two snails are the same or different species. Without this kind of information, we can't even say whether conservation efforts are necessary, let alone how to go about them. But this taxonomic research also reveals that alongside the many disappearing species that we know about, numerous others unknown to science are also slipping away. The extinction of unknown species is a pervasive and largely undiscussed feature of our current period of global biodiversity loss. This lecture is an effort to grapple with this unknown extinction crisis. It explores the invertebrate bias that shapes contemporary taxonomy and conservation efforts, detailing how Hawaii snails come to be known to science or not, and some of the consequences, challenges, and limitations of these processes. But my interest in these questions goes beyond the practices of scientists. At its core, this lecture is an effort to explore the role of practices of lively storying or, or of ethography in the context of unknown loss. Much of my research has been grounded in the conviction that stories can do important ethical work in responding to extinction, providing openings into the remarkable worlds of the disappearing and disappeared, including the many ways in which they're tangled up with and significant to others. But for countless unknown species of snails and other invertebrates, these are stories that we can't really tell. This lecture is prompted in large part by the philosopher Michel Bastian's thoughtful challenge to think more about the possibilities and difficulties of storying unknown extinctions. In this work, Bastian's primary interest is in the extinction of creatures that have been and will remain unknown. But importantly, as she points out, these are creatures who we might sometimes reasonably surmise once existed and even point to basic details such as the ecologies within which they likely occurred. My focus in this lecture is somewhat different, perhaps a little broader. 
Specifically, I'm interested in the diverse gray areas around the edges of our taxonomic knowledge in which species and extinctions slip in and out of both our comprehension and our concern. These are spaces of taxonomic discovery and revision, including the description of numerous new species unknown to science after the fact of their extinction, generally based on their remains. As Rick DeVos has explored, the borders demarcating what will and won't count as a legitimate species, borders that shift with taxonomic practices, albeit with some taxa more than others, play vital roles in determining which individuals' lives and ways of living, and by extension, which absences come to matter in our accounts. In exploring these more ambiguous spaces of knowledge, I aim to draw these species into the discussion of extinction storytelling. While these species are themselves worthy of consideration, as I'll argue in the final section of this lecture, my hope in focusing on them is that they might also provide some avenues into the spaces of complete unknowability, of profound absence that are the focus of Bastian's discussion. In taking up these themes, this lecture itself offers a scattered narrative of sorts, one that aims to attend to, to make some sense of losses that we cannot really know. So amongst all the shells I encountered at the Bishop Museum, Museum that day, those of Corellia terricula stood out. This species of ground-dwelling snail is thought to have been the largest found in the Hawaiian Islands. The conical shells of their kind filled several drawers with their diverse shades of purple and brown. Some of the adult shells I saw were about two inches in length, but others as long as three inches have been reported. These snails were once widely dispersed on the island of Kauai. Writing in 1887, the naturalist David Baldwin reported discovering alluvial deposits that contained multitudes of their shells. And he surmised that they must, at some point in the not too distant past, have been very abundant. But even in his day, they were rare. Today, these shells in a drawer are all that remains of the species. As I look down on these now lifeless shells of Corellia tericula, they seemed so improbably large and awkward. I tried to imagine a snail moving along the ground with a narrow three inch protuberance sticking out behind it. Then I tried to imagine a landscape thick with these incredible creatures. I asked Nori about them and she replied with the same sense of speculative wonder. Just to see them alive and crawling would have been so amazing, she said but try as I might, I can't quite imagine that sight. What is lost with the disappearance of Corellia tericula? What has been and is being lost with the extinction of so many other species of land snails in these islands? There are many answers that might be given to these questions, many layers of disruption, of ending, of transformation that are at work here. Perhaps as Vincien de Pre has argued, we must ultimately conclude that it is an entire world that is lost in extinction, perhaps even a constellation of worlds. While the full substance and complexity of this loss cannot be conveyed in words, some of its rich contours can be. To appreciate the significance of Hawaii snails, it might make sense to start with the question of where this incredible diversity of gastropods came from. Land snails, after all, are not known for their propensity to undertake long journeys, not by land and certainly not by sea. So how did they all end up on this most remote of oceanic archipelagos? The most likely answer, according to scientists, is that the first snails arrived by bird. These journeys would have been made by tiny ancestral forms of species like Corellia tericula. In these travels, snails were aided by their remarkable capacity to seal up their shells behind a layer of mucus insulated from the elements. Upon arrival, the hermaphroditic reproduction of many snail species, able to self-fertilize, or in other cases, to store sperm from copulation for later use, would have given these animals an advantage in successfully establishing in a new land. In many cases, a single snail or any two snails would have been enough. Over millions of years, a handful of individuals arrived in Hawaii 
and did just this. From them, an incredible radiation of diversity evolved with hundreds of new species spreading out across the islands, producing snails of all colors, shapes and sizes. These snails struck up a variety of relationships with the other animals and plants of these islands. Unlike the leaf eating garden snails more familiar to most of us, there are no known snail species from the Hawaiian Islands that consumed living vegetation. Instead, they took up one of two other options. Some were detritivores, living on the ground and breaking down dead vegetation to return to the soil, while others took to the trees, specializing in the consumption of the fungi and other microorganisms that they could scrape from the surface of living leaves. While we cannot know for certain what ecological significance these activities might have had in ancient forests, it seems likely that some of these snails played an important role in maintaining the island's soils. While more speculatively, it's been suggested that the leaf cleaners may have helped to limit the spread of pathogenic surface microbes that can harm plants. With the arrival of Polynesian people in these islands about 1500 years ago, snails entered into a new set of relationships. In varied ways, they wove their way into the lives and cultures of these islands' first people, the Kanaka Maoli. Snails often appear in traditional mo'olelo and oli in stories and chants. When they do, without doubt, the most consistent theme is that of their singing in the forest at night. But snails aren't said to sing at any old time. Rather, their singing is said to be deeply meaningful, often occurring as a sign that after a series of adventures, changes or turbulence, all is pono again. All is righteous, correct and good. In past work, often in collaboration with the late Deborah Bird Rose, I've advocated for the importance of storytelling in responding to extinctions like these. Debbie and I have argued for lively ethnographies, stories that allow us to thicken the presence of these beings at the edge of extinction, to add flesh to the bones of the dead and dying. As we learn about snail biogeography and evolution, about their reproductive and other behaviours, these creatures become something more than another Latin binomial on a long list. They emerge as distinctive ways of life. At the same time, these kinds of stories are also able to draw out how these particular ways of life mattered for others. That as they disappear, they unravel whole constellations of relationships that cut across any simple division between nature and culture, humans and environment. In the case of Hawaii snails, diverse trees, soils, birds and humans have been drawn into this process of loss in ways that I have only been able just to touch on here. So we've called these complex multifaceted consequences of extinction its entangled significance. In storying particular species losses in this way, we've worked to highlight the fact that there is no singular extinction phenomenon. Each species lost is its own unique happening. In fact, we've aimed to particularize the process of extinction even more than this, insisting that for any given extinction, there is no singular meaning or experience. By layering together multiple voices and histories, extinction stories aim to draw out the very different and often unequal ways in which extinctions come to shape the contours of local lives and landscapes. But more than simply recounting this complexity, we've argued that stories offer a particularly rich mode of grappling with it, that storytelling is or can be a fundamentally ethical work. The kinds of extinction stories we've advocated for have emphasized the importance of allowing multiple meanings to travel alongside one another, holding open possibilities and interpretations and refusing the kind of closure that prevents others from speaking or becoming. While stories can certainly be crafted in an effort to shut down this kind of complexity and force through particular conclusions, for example, the kind of invasive narratives that Susanna Lidstrom and, and colleagues have explored. Stories can also be vital technologies for other more open and, in, and ongoing engagements with the world. As Megan Craig notes, narratives have many threads, multiple voices, though we may discern a dominant thread that helps us follow and understand a story as it unfolds. We should also be suspicious of narratives that present themselves as completely self-assured and single-minded as utterly resolved. 
It's this capacity of storytelling to summon up a thicker sense of the diverse, overlapping, and sometimes or often conflicting meanings and consequences of extinction that we have found so ethically productive in our work. Grounded in established critiques of ethics as a calculable and generalizable domain, we work to hold open questions of what or who matters and why, to relentlessly ask with others, what does this loss mean for whom and what else is possible here? In this context, storytelling is an effort to draw ever more voices and perspectives into the discussion, to attend to the situated complexity of this extinction, this encounter, and in so doing, to craft a response, albeit one that is necessarily partial, contestable, and open to revision. As Isabel Stengers has put it, what you are responsible for is paying attention as best you can, to be as discerning, as discriminating as you can about the particular situation. That is, you need to decide in this particular case and not to obey the power of some more general reason. So there's an important role for more generalizing approaches though to animal, environmental and intrahuman ethics in cultivating our capacities to be discerning and discriminating in particular cases. Asking, for example, why and how some individuals or species have value or might be harmed. But within an extinction story, these general, generalizing approaches cannot simply be applied they must be stretched, brought into dialogue, redone or even undone in the particular context of this extinction. In short, we've argued for an emergent ethics, not an applied one. This kind of storytelling demands an engagement with an empirical context that can surprise, demand, twist what we thought we knew about what mattered about the world. Here, theorizing becomes inseparable from the work of description. It becomes, as Donna Haraway has put it, a theory that takes the form of an effort to re-describe something so that it becomes thicker than it first seems, an effort to weave the world together differently in new ways to produce alternative understandings and so possibilities. In taking up such an approach, we work to unsettle the power of more abstract theorizing, allowing the wider world to push back, in Stenger's words, giving the issue the power to oblige us to think. In an important sense, my focus in this lecture on unknown extinctions was determined by snails in just this way. While questions of taxonomy lingered around the edges of my earlier work, much, much of it on avian extinctions, as I shifted my attention over the last few years to snails, I learned that these questions of taxonomy are front and center in gastropod extinctions as they are with most invertebrates. Likewise, as we will see, snails through their own specific morphologies, in particular their readily preserved shells, have a distinctive capacity to render these extinctions visible after the fact. It's precisely these kinds of particularities that a storied emergent ethics aims to recognize, to be compelled and guided by. In sharing multiplicitous layered stories of this kind, we take up the work of attending to the world, both as teller and listener. This attention pushes storytelling beyond the simple act of transmission, communicating ethical findings or conclusions. No doubt stories are often powerful modes of conveying information of all kinds, made so in large part by their memorable, accessible and engaging format. But they're more than this. Storytelling is also transformative. As Megan Craig notes, the stories we tell and those we hear bear profoundly upon the texture of our lives and our openness or closeness to other forms of life. In summoning up other beings and their worlds of relationship, stories draw us into a situated encounter, into new understandings and with them new responsibilities. In this context, as Debbie Rose and I have put it elsewhere, stories can be opportunities to test and explore, to cultivate the intellectual, emotional and critical capacities necessary to recognize our own implication in the world, the consequences of our actions and possibilities for other kinds of futures. This section is called the invertebrate bias. Talking to staff at the Bishop Museum, 
I got my first real sense of the invertebrate bias at the heart of our current biodiversity crisis. It's difficult to adequately express just how little we know about the crawling, buzzing, fluttering, creeping, and of course, sliming world of invertebrates. In part, this is simply a question of their sheer voluminous diversity. Invertebrates make up the vast majority of the animal kingdom, probably somewhere in the order of 99%. But it's also a question of interest and research focus. Despite their much smaller numbers, a tiny subsection of the planet's vertebrate species attracts the vast majority of the funding for both basic research and for conservation. Meanwhile, most of the world's invertebrates still haven't even been described by science. In popular news media around the world, stories of recently discovered species are frequently reported as though new species are hard to come by. The reality is more complex or at least more patchy. While identifying and formally describing a new species is an involved process, somewhere in the region of 10,000 such discoveries take place each year. They just don't usually involve organisms with backbones. The taxonomic work involved in describing a new species draws together a variety of strands of information. In the earliest days of, ta of snail taxonomy, many new species were declared solely on the basis of their distribution and shell morphology. Indeed, for well over a century, the study of snail taxonomy was so shell focused that it was largely understood to be the province of conchologists, those whose sole focus is these calciferous components. Gradually though, from the late 19th century, studies of the internal anatomy of snails were added to this taxonomic picture. Today, the tools of molecular biology have also joined the lineup. Importantly, new approaches to taxonomy have not simply superseded the old, Instead, they've been layered over one another to produce an integrative approach that's now considered by many to be a requirement for good taxonomic work. When it comes to snails, this is an approach grounded in the understanding that no single part of the organism, not its shell or its fleshy anatomy or even its DNA, can provide simple and definitive answers. In each case, similarities and differences might indicate phylogeny or they may be the result of convergent evolution. For example, similar shell structures may be the result of adaptation to a common lifestyle or predator. Consider, for example, the very similar yet unrelated shells of Hawaii's Akatanella snails and those of, uh, of the Ligus snails of Florida. Two groups of tree snails whose shells seem to have converged on roughly the same form as a result of their similar lifestyles. Genetic similarities, Ken and Nori explained to me, might be produced in the same way. If, for example, you're looking at the genes associated with temperature tolerance, they might accumulate mutations in a way that makes two species that have undergone similar selection pressures look more related phylogenetically than they actually are. Examining multiple gene sequences can help to address this issue, but it can't overcome it altogether. When a new species is discovered, uh, it formally enters the space of scientific knowledge through the act of being described in a published article. This practice dates back to the 18th century Swedish botanist Carl Linnaeus and the birth of modern taxonomy. But over the centuries, it's been increasingly formalized. It was Linnaeus who defined and popularized the system of binomial nomenclature whereby each species is given a two-part Latin-esque name that includes its genus and species name. And in so doing, Linnaeus began a more unified effort to name and order the great Systema Naturae. But despite centuries of taxonomic work since Linnaeus, a great deal remains to be done. We don't have any hard numbers to rely on here. We don't know how many species there are on the planet, nor do we even know precisely how many of them have already been described because there is no single master list that we can consult. While estimates vary considerably, some reasonable working figures are that taxonomists have identified somewhere in the region of 1.75 million of the roughly 10 million species of plants, animals, and fungi that we share this planet with. This leaves about 8 million unknown species, about 80% of those thought to exist, the majority of which are thought to be invertebrates, especially insects. 
So these unknown species are not simply a puzzle for curious taxonomists. In our present time, a period that many are now describing as the sixth mass extinction event since complex life evolved on this planet, countless species that have never quite managed to appear to us or to appear to science in the first place are disappearing forever. The fact that science has not yet described a species does not afford it any kind of special protection from extinction. Instead, there's every reason to believe that these unknown species are being lost at least as quickly as those that we do know about. In fact, most scientists who have spent time thinking about how to make sense of the level of extinction amongst unknown species have reached the conclusion that, if anything, they're likely to be disappearing more quickly than the species we do know about. But even amongst those invertebrates that have been described, there is a readily discernible bias in what we know about them. Importantly, most of these species lack the data to allow their conservation status to be assessed. One recent study found that while the conservation status of 90% of the mammals, birds and amphibians had been evaluated, amongst the described mollusks, the figure was 3%, snails and mollusks. Uh, and, and mollusks are one of the better studied invertebrate groups, with the figure for insects being closer to 0.08. This means, as Nori summed it up for me, the conservation status of fewer than 1% of the world's invertebrate species has been assessed. For all of the others, we just don't know enough to say how they're doing. This complex situation burst onto the world stage in 2019 when one of the peak international bodies concerned with conservation, the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, or IPBES for short, announced that over a million species were at risk of extinction. Skeptics immediately jumped on this number of a million species and argued that the most comprehensive international list of threatened species, the IUCN Red List, at the time included only about 28,000 species, threatened species. The very significant gap between these two numbers, 28,000 and a million, is precisely what is at issue here. The Red List figure includes only those threatened species that have not only been described by science, but have also been the subject of detailed ongoing studies to assess their conservation status. In contrast, the IPBS estimate of a million threatened species was based on mathematical modeling in an effort to take account of the many, many species that we know little to nothing about, the vast majority of which we don't even have names for. As Ken explained to me, snails and other invertebrates present conservationists with a really difficult situation here. As he put it, we don't know how to save them because we can't even name most of them. We don't even have a name for them. We don't know if that's the same species as this one here. And if we can't name it, we can't tell you anything about its biology. We can't tell you how many offspring it has per year. We don't know how it mates. We don't know what it eats. We know almost nothing about them. The designation and naming of a species is an essential part of the work of care as is practiced in contemporary biodiversity conservation. As Joshua Trey Barnett has noted, taxonomic work brings species into the world in some sense as distinct concrete entities. In his words, the act of naming delivers species, which strictly speaking cannot be observed over to us as something we can consciously consider, think about, write on and care for. In this sense, taxonomic names are the condition of the possibility for the continuing care of a species, a vital precondition, both for the kind of basic research that Ken's describing, as well as for the allocation of conservation funding under species-centric regimes like the US Endangered Species Act that now dominate conservation efforts in many parts of the world. And I should note here as an aside um, that I don't deal, as you may have noticed in this lecture, with other forms of, um, of taxonomic naming with uh, indigenous systems and, and other forms of dividing up and naming um, the modern human world. Uh, that's the topic I take up in detail in another part of this book that I'm writing on Hawaii snails. But in this particular paper and this chapter, uh, I'm focused really on this question of scientific taxonomy as a particularly um, 
detailed, interesting and highly consequential mode of dividing up uh, and naming the world. So the state of our, our current knowledge with regard to in, invertebrates reminds us that for a species to be known in a meaningful sense to science requires much more than it's simply having been described and recognized as a species. The division between the known and the unknown is not a black and white one, but a space comprised of many gradations of gray. As the biologist Elaine Du Bois has noted, it would be misleading to consider that the 1.75 million named species are known to science. Actually, many of them in an unknown proportion have only been the subject of a single scientific publication, providing the original description of the type specimen, and they are therefore scarcely more than mere nomina on lists. So taxonomy takes on a very particular form when it comes to many of these invertebrate groups like Hawaii snails that are highly diverse and relatively understudied, but also rapidly disappearing. In contrast to birds and mammals, where almost all species are thought to be described, snails and many other invertebrates are in the midst of ongoing discovery and revision. In these contexts, the taxonomy can't simply be assumed. It doesn't sit quietly in the background, largely settled, rearing its head every now and again, when, for example, a species is reclassified as a subspecies. Instead, for snails and many other invertebrates, taxonomic work takes place within the ongoing folds of conservation efforts. It is, as Ken put it to me, a practice of triage taxonomy, identifying species in an effort to save them, focusing on groups that there's still time to help and then describing them with as much useful information as possible so that they might be added to the lists of those in need and perhaps one day even officially listed as threatened. Traces of an unknown extinction crisis. Not all of the snail shells held at the Bishop Museum are to be found in the malacology collections carefully organized and labeled cabinets. In dark corners and cupboards, other shells are waiting. Some of them, Nori told me, were collected over a hundred years ago. Some were donated by private collectors. Others were gathered on museum expeditions. Either way, they arrived without the time or resources to adequately catalog them. These shells now sit in cardboard boxes, old mason jars, and an assortment of other containers. Importantly, there are without doubt numerous new species, unknown to science, waiting to be described amongst these shells. We should expect, however, that when and if these species are one day described, most of them will already be extinct when this happens. Their shells will serve only as an announcement of a loss that took place at a time that it was not known. Indeed, over roughly the last decade or so, a number of concrete examples have emerged of recent snail extinctions previously unknown, of previously unknown species. Some of these species have been discovered through specimens in museum collections. Others have been discovered as shells deposited in the landscape. In one recent study, nine new species from the Gambia Islands of French Polynesia were discovered. Shells from all of them had been collected in the 1930s and had sat undescribed within the Bishop Museum. By the time they were described, however, follow-up surveys could find no trace of them in the environment. It's hard to make sense of these unknown extinctions of species that are discovered already lost. A species bursts into existence, ready to be named, described, and hopefully admired. But at the same time, it's already a former species, a lingering remnant like a shell, the only record of its having lived at all. We can make intuitive sense, I think, of this when it happens, when it involves the discoveries of fossils, brontosaurus and mammoths, that roamed the earth long before our time. But it's somehow a more unsettling prospect when these unknown losses become contemporary companions. As odd though as the phenomenon of unknown extinctions may seem, it turns out to actually be the norm, indeed overwhelmingly so. When you think about it, how could things be otherwise? There are thought to be roughly five times as many undescribed species as there are described ones. And as noted above, there's no reason to think that these unknown species are being spared the impacts of our current period of mass extinction. 
We're living in the midst of an extinction crisis that's stripping innumerable species out of the world before we've even realized they're here. The incredible loss of diverse plants and animals that we do know about, that we can name, that we can make some partial sense of, is only one side of the coin. While there is, without doubt, much that remains unseen, even actively ignored about all of the species that are being lost today, it's vital, I think, that we appreciate that there's something else, something different going on here as well. An unknown extinction crisis that is at once both larger and more thoroughly beyond the scope of our comprehension. What's unique then about stories of snails that went extinct before discovery is not this fact in itself, but rather that their existence and their extinction has come to be known about at all. In most cases, when the last of a species dies, especially an invertebrate species, all record of it vanishes with these individuals. From the diverse ecologies of soil biota that have likely disappeared with changes in agriculture that have pumped more and more synthetic chemicals into our soils, and the diverse species and communities of stygofauna that have been lost to mining and other extractive impacts on groundwater systems. Through to the complex communities of specialists that once fed on the whale carcasses that fell to the deep sea floor before commercial whaling led to the removal to their removal from the oceans. In all of these and many other examples within recorded history, numerous species in various ecosystems have no doubt disappeared without a trace. But snails have a particular advantage over many other invertebrates, over many other species when it comes to being discovered post-extinction. Unlike the majority of other invertebrates whose soft bodies mean that they frequently leave no earthly trace, snails possess a remarkable calciferous remainder. In their shells, they leave behind a record of their presence, even if a thoroughly imperfect and incomplete one. While I noted a moment ago, um, taxonomists these days prefer to look at a variety of other factors in addition to shell morphology. When the shells of a snail are all that's left, it's still often possible, albeit slower and more difficult, to describe species in this way. A snail shell is a miraculous thing. For hundreds of millions of years, snails have been wandering the planet, its oceans, rivers, and lands, their fleshy, porous bodies protected by these sturdy calcium carbonate structures. These shells provide a record of a life. The apex or innermost point of the spiral is the oldest part of any shell. When a terrestrial snail is hatched or born, it begins life with this tiny shell. As it grows, it secretes calcium carbonate and other chemicals from its mantle to build up around the aperture and incrementally extend the outermost whirl of the shell. Unlike arthropods and other invertebrates that have an exoskeleton that has to be shed to allow growth, snails have evolved protection that can expand or grow with them, never requiring a period of vulnerable exposure. Albeit, uh, a solution, if you like, that consumes as much as half of the energy that they invest in their growth. If you allow your eyes to trace that spiraling pattern of a snail's shell outwards from apex to aperture, you're retracing the life history of this tiny being condensed into a solid form. In a variety of ways, these shells can be read to provide information about the lives they once contained. The thickness of a snail's shell can vary greatly depending on the nutrition available in the environment, while periods of life in which growth ceased altogether can be marked with a little scar called a varix, a scar that offers a record of the conditions experienced by an individual at a given point in time. At a much longer temporal scale, shells also record some of the features of the life of a species with specific adaptations reflecting things like the habitat they occupy, their dietary specializations and the predators they lived amongst. For those who are able to read them, shells can not only announce the form of presence of a now extinct species, they can also provide us with some important glimpses into its former existence. To be sure, other creatures can also leave important traces after extinction. With the aid of climate controlled museums, even the tiniest and most fragile species are now sometimes able to be discovered long after they've disappeared. 
perhaps a butterfly pinned to a board or a sample of leaves and flowers pressed between pages. In this regard, the plants and animals that fascinated the collectors of the past, including Hawaii's larger, more colorful snails, are the ones whose unknown extinctions are most likely not to remain that way. But courtesy of their shells, snails are amongst that small club of invertebrates that don't require museums. As Ira Richling and Philippe Boucher, the biologists who discovered the nine new snail species in the Gambia Islands have put it, documenting extinction when it takes place even before scientific collection is limited essentially to vertebrates, snails, and to some extent crustaceans. These taxa have in common that they leave post-mortem remains, bones, shells, and carapaces that can be traced in the archeological record or in discrete soil or cave horizons. There are no precise figures available on how long snail shells endure in this way. A great deal depends on the size and thickness of the particular shell, as well as the soil, climatic and other environmental conditions. Up in the topsoil, some shells have been shown to be badly degraded in as little as a few months, while others have lasted decades, perhaps even a century. Tucked away a little deeper though, as subfossils, some land snail shells have been shown to survive largely intact for tens or even hundreds of thousands of years. In this way, snails, more than most other living beings, perhaps more than any other, have the capacity to interrupt the pervasive phenomenon of unknown extinctions, to draw our attention towards and allow us to see previously unnoticed losses. As a highly diverse and highly threatened taxa with a durable remainder, snails find themselves positioned somewhere between invertebrates and the vertebrates, possessing the abundance of species found amongst the invertebrates and the hard architecture of many vertebrates. It is this relatively unique position that makes snails not only an emblem, but with a little luck, potentially also a powerful disruptor of our rapidly unfolding unknown extinction crisis. Storying the unknown. Our current planetary predicament requires a concerted effort to get to know as many of Earth's creatures as possible. Not only to document their existence, but to understand their conservation status and their needs. But these efforts to know are also not enough. The reality is that in the coming decades, innumerable undescribed species will become extinct. We simply will not be able to describe them, let alone produce meaningful knowledge about them in time. Amidst a long list of other difficult insights that Ken shared with me in our conversations, one of the most sobering was that at the current rate of taxonomic progress, it'll take roughly another 500 years to describe all of the world's invertebrates. At current rates of extinction, hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions more of them will be gone by then. How might we learn to appreciate, to care for, and perhaps even to conserve these unknown others? One obvious response is that we need to move away from, or at least supplement, species-centric approaches to conservation, with an emphasis on protecting and perhaps restoring whole ecosystems, which involve many more players and processes than we can possibly account for. There's an ongoing discussion taking place in conservation biology and the environmental humanities and other related fields about this balance, including the extent to which charismatic umbrella species might actually enable the conservation of whole ecosystems, such that as Jean-Christophe V, the deputy head of the IUCN species program has suggested, these two approaches, conserving endangered species and conserving ecosystems, might in effect be doing the same thing, but with different packaging in his words. This is a complex topic that cannot be pursued here. It seems important to note, however, that if we want to be able to determine whether ecosystem level conservation programs are working for species, then we'll need a good sense of who actually inhabits these places and how our actions are impacting on them. And so there will ultimately be no getting away from the necessity of taxonomic research. As a storyteller of extinction, however, all of these unknown extinctions have weighed on me in another way too. It's to these specific issues that I'd like to turn in this final section. As I've already noted, 
the extinction stories that have animated much of my work have aimed to draw us into disappearing worlds to allow us to see and appreciate the intimate particularities of disappearing or disappeared ways of life. In large part, these stories might do this through conveying something of the lives these creatures live and the diverse ways in which they matter to a broader community of life, human and not. It's in this way that this kind of storytelling might cultivate a sense of curiosity and connection that draws us into new, new accountabilities, into an ethical encounter. But for the multitude of unknown others, we're missing precisely this information about them and their worlds. Indeed, this is the case too, even for many of those species that have been named by taxonomists. We don't know how they live, nor do we know who else they matter to or how. What role might stories play in this context? As Michel Bastian has asked, what would it mean to tell ethical stories of becomings with the unknown and the unrecognizable? In this context, it seems to me that we need expansive storying practices. Part of this work lies in cultivating more deliberate efforts to story into and around the edges of the unknown. But stories, such stories, in collaboration with taxonomists and other scientists, aim to attend to the many species that we do not yet know enough about, to make some sense of who they are and why they matter perhaps only to point to the kinds of ecosystems in which they're likely to occur. At the very least, these stories might acknowledge their threatened existence. This lecture, I hope, offers one such story. At a more fundamental level, however, I think that many other extinction stories are already grappling with these unknown others, unknown extinctions in important ways, or at least they're creating avenues into care for them. Importantly, in this regard, I do not see our lack of physical proximity, the impossibility of a face-to-face -face encounter with these unknown others to be a significant barrier to our entering into and indeed drawing others into an ethical encounter. Far more significant for these storying practices, I think, is the need for some sort of meaningful knowledge about or in relation to these others. But here, I think that in practice, there might be more flexibility, diversity, and breadth in the forms this knowledge can take and what we can do with it than has always been made explicit in my own and others' accounts. In this regard, I'd like to suggest that there are three key ways in which the kind of extinction stories I've described in this lecture are attempting to do an expansive storying that is about much more than the particular species that reside at their centers. Whole worlds spiral out from these storied cores. In the first instance, many extinction stories, I think, seek to account for and hold on to both the connectivities and the uncertainties that pervade the living world and our knowledge of it. These stories begin with snails or other creatures, but they aim to draw us out from there, perhaps into an appreciation of the uniqueness of the particular landscape and ecosystem, or into a discussion of deep cultural relationships with local people. These tales can only ever capture a small part of what is significant about specific others. In some cases, this is a product of a lack of knowledge. For example, we just don't know in what ways and to what extent Hawaiian snails matter to the soils and trees of the forests. While we can speculate, much will escape our knowing. In this way, these stories are always already stories about and for a host of others, known and unknown. They help us to appreciate that nothing comes without its world, to quote Maria Poon de la Barricasa, and that to care for a species is to be drawn into, to become accountable for a diverse web of lives and relationships. Beyond these embodied connectivities, though, I think the particular stories that we tell are also openings in other ways. Life is not without its patterns of similarity and difference. Learning to appreciate the intricacies of a Corellia turricula shell is in many ways at least a transferable skill. It enables us to see and understand the shells of other snail species in new ways, perhaps through a consideration of differences of function or formation. It might also draw us into a consideration of everything from the exoskeletons of insects to the slowly accreted calciferous tusks of an elephant. <laughs> 
Likewise, understanding other facets of stale life and behavior might attune us in new ways to the wonders of diverse modes of inhabiting and experiencing the world beyond our own capacities and proclivities. Countless other unknown species likely share some of these features in their own distinctive ways. As such, telling stories about snails we already know a little or a lot about might help to cultivate appreciation for a host of others, gastropod and not, known and unknown. Taken together, I think these two openings produce a third. They help us to see that learning to appreciate a particular snail species in a particular place can never be an isolated act. The aim of telling this kind of story is not to add yet another snail species or even a handful of species to the list of extinctions we now know and care about. Nor would it be simply to add Hawaiian forest ecologies or all snails to such a list. Rather, the work of extinction stories is to draw us into an expansive space of responsibility, to contribute to a broader reorientation of thought and action in our relationships with our living world. In short, the work of telling extinction stories is not cumulative, but transformative not about creating a growing inventory of concern that might in some strange way mirror the efforts of taxonomists, but rather about cultivating an opening. It's about learning to see the world differently, learning to appreciate differently, and ultimately about becoming ourselves different in the process. In all three of these ways, relational connectivities, patterned similarities, and ethical transformation, Extinction stories, I think, reach out beyond the particular species whose lives they recount to draw us into responsibility and care for others, both known and unknown. To some extent, I think that this expansive storing is already at the heart of the extinction stories that Debbie Rose and I and others have aimed to tell. Like many things, however, our practice benefits from careful attention, from the effort to make explicit what we do and why, and will benefit more still from efforts to direct attention towards the countless unknown others disappearing around us. In this way, our extinction stories might also add some limited speculative contour to the undifferentiated mass of the unknown that Michelle Bastian has described that's disappearing around us. Returning to those drawers full of shells in the Bishop Museum, I'm more convinced than ever of both the importance of getting to know this diversity intimately and of the need for modes of appreciation and storying that exceed our direct knowing. Years after my first encounter with these shells, I find myself not much better equipped as a taxonomist, albeit with a much greater appreciation of some of the many things that I do not know enough about. While working to know more matters profoundly, it challenges us and expands our capacity to care for, to conserve, and ultimately to live well with others. In this era of escalating loss, our knowledge cannot mark the limits of our care. In addition, we need to find new, expansive ways to make sense, to make connections into the vast and threatened worlds of all those incredible beings that are buzzing, crawling, whirling, and yes, sliming around us unseen and unappreciated. Thank you very much.